This is the Porsche that was faster than F1 and smashed a 35 year Nurbo win lap record. I've spoken about it before, but this time I got an interview with the technical project lead to understand exactly how Porsche did it. And it's crazy stuff. It's almost a real life version of my F1 with no rules video from a few weeks ago. They took their already extremely fast LMP1 car and made it over 12 seconds faster at Spa. That's 11% quicker, a huge amount in motorsport. So let me explain how Porsche's engineers designed and developed a car that goes through a rouge like this. I've been through Eau Rouge hundreds of times and that is fast. So let's briefly run through the records of this car before we get into the engineering tricks they used to make it go faster. The biggest record and the main target for Porsche was the Nürburgring Nordschleife lap record. It had stood for 35 years and was held by another Porsche, the 956 Group C car driven by Stefan Beloff. All eyes are on the Porsche's latest recruit, Stefan Beloff, who had stunned the motor racing world with an incredible pole position time at the previous round at Silverstone. This was a legendary lap in motorsport set in 1983. And those Group C cars were also legendary. Group C was a playground for development in motorsport, allowing engineers lots of freedom with aerodynamics, materials and engine configurations, including turbocharging. Going past, up towards the start finish line, number two, the Rothmans Porsche with an incredible time of six minutes, 11.13 seconds. And Group C produced some of our favorite cars. This Porsche 956, the Cyber Mercedes C9, the Jaguar XJR series, and the Mazda 787B. Absolutely beautiful work, Group C. But sadly, Beloff died just two years after breaking the Nürburgring lap record, while again driving a 956, though this time at Spa. The next record the team broke was just before the Nordschleife record in 2018. Actually, while preparing for that record, while they were at Spa. Neil Yarny completed a lap in a 1 minute 41.7, beating Lewis Hamilton's lap from the previous year in the Mercedes W07 by 8 tenths of a second. However, F1 did go faster again later in 2018, with Vettel in a Ferrari on a 1 minute 41.5, and then Hamilton again in 2020 with a 1 minute 41.2. So yeah, F1 did beat Porsche again, but not by much. And remember that these were the fastest F1 cars that we've ever seen. And the Porsche time is still quicker than the current crop of F1 cars. So it does hold up pretty well. Then in September 2018, the team took the car to the awesome circuit that is Laguna Seca. And again, unofficially broke the lap record. This lap record had been held since the year 2000 by a monstrous kart car driven by Helio Castroneves. By the way, these kart cars were awesome. 900 horsepower V8s running on metal. Methanol. Yes, the same methanol that burns without a flame. And just look at the racing. Proper cars, proper tracks, and no power steering. I absolutely love it. So Helio had set a time of a 1 minute 7.7 .7 during qualifying, and the Porsche then smashed through that 18 years later with a 1 minute 5.7. But look, there was one circuit they went to and didn't break the record. And I promise this is the last time I'll mention it. But they did go to Brands Hatch and not break the record, set by yours truly. All right, yeah, of course. I'm stopping it, that's it, no more. So to be fair to Porsche, they did have to limit something on the car, which I'm going to reveal later on. And that would have seriously hindered their chances of the record. Without that, they probably would have beaten my time. Probably. So let's move on. This is Steven Mittas. He was chief race engineer for the Porsche LMP team, the team that won Le Mans three years in a row, and who was then the technical project lead for the 919 Evo, this wild experiment. I spoke to him on the Driver 61 podcast, and this was one of my favorite interviews, because what Porsche allowed him and his team to do was every engineer's dream. Make a car go as fast as you can, without any rules. The only thing limiting them was creativity, structural integrity, and of course, some kind of budget. So where does a crazy project like this start? And how on earth do you convince a large automotive manufacturer that it's a good idea? Well, it all starts with a question. What could our 919 hybrid even be like, or hybrid be like, if we had the opportunity to just, you know, turn up the 919 to 11? And so Stephen went to Andreas Seidel, who was the team principal of the LMP project, and incredibly, he and the Porsche board said yes. Go for it, guys. However, the team would only have a very small budget, 
and less than a year to get the job done. An incredibly small amount of time to get this thing working and working well. The project started in September 2017, where the team only had the car from that season and an idea to produce a no rules car. By the end of November, the team was testing a car with Evo parts on it. Then through early spring in 2018, the team continued testing using the Porsche Proving Ground in Visac. Now, it's worth noting that the Proving Ground isn't really designed for an almost 1200 horsepower race car. It's quite twisty, and so I doubt the team would have got any significant aero data from those tests. Then in April, the team did a three day test at Spa, during which they broke the unofficial lap record. Then they moved to the Nürburgring for a test before the final lap record attempt in June. There are a few things that are impressive here. First, the team managed to turn things around very quickly. And I suppose that's not entirely surprising. These teams are used to rapid development as we see in F1, but also just the lack of testing miles. They basically tested on a twisty road car proving ground, did a few days at Spa and a final test at the Nürburgring. That's not very many miles at all. That might be enough if you're making a few tweaks to a car, but these guys were making fundamental changes to the Porsche, pushing it way further than ever before. So where on earth do you begin with a project like this? How do you even start thinking about it? Well, Steven's idea was to focus on the easier wins and stay away from the potential problems. And try to uh, at least um, understand which ones were the, the low hanging fruit, which ones were worth the risk and which ones we possibly couldn't get done in the, in the time and with, with the financial constraints we had. And that makes sense. When you have such little time and a limited budget, you need to lower the risk of things not working out. But it's not just about adding as much power and grip as possible. Doing a sub six minute lap at the Nürburgring is no joke. To do that, you have to go fast really fast. As we know, if things go wrong at the Nürburgring, the consequences can be dire. Remember, things like the monocoque and the safety equipment are designed for a certain specification of car. And now the Porsche team were heading into the unknown and they wanted to do that as safely as possible. If you want to increase the performance by 50%, there's going to be consequences. And so we were very aware of that and uh, monitoring that as we introduced the extra performance on the vehicle step by step by step. So back to the low hanging fruit. What was the first area that the team looked at? Well, the tires, the parts that connect the car to the track, make them wider, make them stickier, and you'll have a car that brakes, turns and accelerates faster. Now, I've seen comments on this channel that say a tire's width doesn't affect the grip, but that just isn't right with race car tires. To a point, you simply want wider tires made of the softest compound. That will give you the most grip. But if you make wider tires, you need to make wider wheels. And that's where the team ran into their first problem. It was going to take the wheel manufacturer 12 months to produce wider tires, by which time the deadline set by the Porsche board would be over. So we were constrained to the same rims that we had for the 919. In the end, the team used tires that looked exactly like the LMP1 tires that they'd used at Le Mans. The construction of the tires, how it was made, its materials, its structure and design was the same as the race tire but the compound was different. The compound was a, a very soft, special compound from Michelin, which uh, would be something similar in philosophy to an old F1 quality tire. And while the compound was an improvement, the tire's construction was actually going to be a weak point. Stephen told me they were aiming to add 50% performance to the car. Now, of course, that doesn't half the lap time, but it is a massive boost in the load going through the car. Just imagine all that extra downforce being generated, that load passing through the bodywork, the monocoque, the suspension, and finally into the tires. Then think about the tires themselves. The sidewall gets squashed every time it comes around to the contact patch. And if the construction of the tire is not as strong, this sidewall will get squashed even more. And that's just on the straights. You can imagine what happens when going around the corners at even higher speeds. And so having tires that aren't designed for these much higher loads was a concern. We needed to increase the pressures so we can ensure the basic structural integrity of the tires were maintained. And on the Nordschleifer, we ended up with three bar of tire pressure in the tire. Three bar, that's 44 PSI, way more than race cars like to run and even quite a lot more than you'd have in your road car. And the simple principle here is to add so much pressure to the tire that it can hold itself up when under these massive loads. And while this allows the car to run more aero and be faster through the quicker corners, a high tire pressure like this really doesn't help with mechanical grip, which is what I mentioned earlier about my lap record at Brands Hatch. The Brands Hatch Indy circuit is short and as race circuits go, pretty twisty. 
It only have two corners where the aerodynamics really work, but it has way more mechanically gripped corners, which are second and third gear corners that aren't really fast enough to generate significant downforce. And so with a circuit more sensitive to mechanical grip, the overinflated tires on the Porsche were going to struggle. Well, that's their excuse anyway. I'm joking, it's a very fast car. Yes, with a very fast driver actually. So with the sticky bits thought about, what's next? So then obviously the next thing to do is weight, aero, power. Three things all drivers and engineers want. Less weight, more grip, and more power. So let's take a look at the genius engineering that Porsche carried out on each area of the car. The powertrain, the aero, including some moving parts, the suspension, adding lightness, and braking and stability controls. But before we get into the incredible engineering of the 919 Evo, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant. They're the best way to learn about engineering, data analysis, and so much more. And learning these topics doesn't cost thousands or take years of schooling. It's free and easy with Brilliant. Whatever your skill level, their content is customized to fit your needs and lets you solve at your own pace with their bite-sized lessons. I've enjoyed the case study on electric cars in the data analysis course. In this lesson, I was able to work with real sales and cost data of electric and gas-powered cars. But if that's not up your street, they have thousands of fun and interactive lessons covering basic to advanced topics. To try everything Brilliant offers free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash driver61 or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now, back to the video. Let's start with the powertrain. The original 919 race car is a V4 turbocharged hybrid system with a combined output of about 900 horsepower. But with no rules, the team were able to improve that pretty quickly. Now, they didn't have the time or money to swap the engine out entirely. So it was a case of improving what they already had. They needed to keep the existing V4 and the hybrid system. And it seems that that was relatively simple. In LMP1, there was a limit to how quickly you could flow fuel into the engine and how much of the battery power was able to be used. The 919 Evo team simply removed the fuel flow restriction, remapped the software so the combustion engine worked properly, and then removed the limit on the e-machine, the electric part of the powertrain. And this gained them a lot, with the Evo now producing 1160 horsepower. But of course, being engineers, they wanted to push things further. There was a discussion at one point to put a bigger turbo on it, because obviously we were hungry for more, but that, that would have come, become complicated. So again, because of time constraints and the complexity this would have added, the team didn't think the turbo was worthwhile. Okay, onto the aero, and this is where the team made some huge gains. The Evo created more peak downforce than the race car did in its highest downforce setting, but created less drag than the race car did at Le Mans. An incredible feat. The team developed a lot of the car using CFD and then took the car to the wind tunnel for a physical test. But again, the team ran into a problem. And we're also limited by the, the tub itself because the car was being designed for a set of regulations mm. in LMP1. And uh, yeah, there was a point where they said we can't have more downforce. The tub or monocoque is at the core of the car's structure. It's where the driver sits and basically what the rest of the car is bolted to. All of the car's loads go through the tub. And the structural team at Porsche had to ask the aero team to stop creating more downforce. Otherwise, the tub ran the risk of breaking. Not what you want when you're flat out at the Nürburgring, or anywhere really. So let's split the car up into the different aero sections. The front diffuser, the rear diffuser, the skirts, active aero and the rear wing and understand how they created tub shattering downforce. The front diffuser was all new. The overhang compared to the original race car was much longer, which meant more downforce. And because there were no rules to follow, the diffuser was also more aggressive. It was twice as tall as the original version, which is basically free downforce. And as we spoke about in our F1 with no rules video, this is an area for huge gains, as it's typically an area of huge restriction in racing regulations. As with the front diffuser, the team simply focused on making a longer and taller rear diffuser. And although simple, this is worth explaining. A longer and taller diffuser produces more downforce because it more efficiently accelerates the airflow under the car. This acceleration creates a lower pressure area beneath the car, enhancing downforce. Compared to a shorter diffuser, the longer path allows the air more time to expand and speed up, while the increased height provides a larger volume for the air to accelerate through, both of which create less pressure and so more downforce. But there's another problem with the original 919 floor. 
thanks to the pesky regulations. A lot of the air that runs underneath the car gets accelerated and creates downforce. But where the floor creates low pressure beneath, higher pressure from the outside can leak in, meaning a reduction in downforce. So as we spoke about in our F1 with no rules video, the solution are skirts, basically walls that seal the side of the floor. So the air under the floor can more effectively suck it down. As you likely know, this was banned in F1 in 1981 for precisely the reason Porsche wanted to use it, because of how much it affects the cornering speed. It increases them a lot. But it wasn't that easy. The most effective type of skirt to use is one that floats or slides. And it's best explained if I show you what they came up with in F1. Take a look at this picture of the Lotus 79. The skirt is the part that runs along the bottom of the side pod. And in this case, it moves up and down into the pod. This is because a car's ride height changes depending on whether it's cornering, braking, or accelerating. And having the skirts float means that it's always sealed. And so is as effective as possible. But now take a look at the original 919. First, you'll notice that aerodynamics have come a long way in 40 years. And you'll see that the side pods are very sculpted. So there's no for a sliding skirt to slide into. Packaging a sliding skirt in the side pods was pretty much impossible. Mm. So we had to get creative with what we wanted to do with the skirts. So Porsche needed a solution that could be bolted onto the edge of the floor and that didn't slide up and down. So if the skirt doesn't move, it must flex itself. The problem went to Porsche's material department who came up with a number of solutions and the team tested them to varying degrees of success. And although the skirts will make a huge difference to lap time, it's a challenging thing to get right. Make the material too soft and it wears away very quickly quickly and then reduces downforce. Make the material too hard and you run the risk of the load going through the skirts and not the tires, which is not what you want. And this is something that the team saw in testing. Where we had the skirts bolted to the side of the floor and just dragging <laughs> uh, along the ground. We obviously saw huge increases in downforce and performance, but in those instances you end up having probably six contact patches on the ground, not just so at Spa, the team ran a thick rubber version of the skirt, which was apparently very effective. Although the driver, Neil Yarny, came in after just a few laps, as he thought the car was broken. In fact, the rubber was vibrating at a really high frequency and caused a high-pitched squealing noise. And so there was nothing wrong with the car. But it just goes to show the frame of mind when testing a proper prototype car. They're pushing the limits. Things can go wrong, and the drivers are very aware of that. Then at the Nürburgring, the team moved to a carbon skirt that was hinged, and you can see that in these images. And when you compare the skirted version of the 919 to the non-skirted version, you can see the vast difference. Just imagine all the outside air leaking into the floor through that huge gap. And while this solution wasn't perfect, they would have liked a sliding skirt, it was the best compromise considering the time and the money that the team had. And even this solution would have added a lot of downforce without adding too much drag. So before we get into the movable wings, let's take a look at the rear wing. You might be asking what genius solution did Porsche's top engineers come up with? Well, they just made it bigger and moved it back a bit. In the rear wing was uh, visually the biggest difference because uh, it was set further rearwards of the car. It was something like half a meter longer as a result. Now, it's easy to understand how a wider and deeper wing adds downforce, but why exactly would it want to be further back? Well, as we spoke about with Willem, the air flowing over the rear wing of a race car interacts a lot with the air flowing from under the floor. The air is connecting up again at the rear of the car. So if you place the rear wing in just the right position, you can use it to speed up the air coming out of the floor. And faster air means lower pressure, which means more downforce. But there were some issues. Again, because the Porsche Aero team had exceeded their goals. The load of the rear wing comes through this swan neck, which in turn goes onto the gearbox housing. But the rear wing was creating so much downforce, there were worries around the strength of the gearbox. Again, you don't want that snapping when driving at 300 kilometers an hour at the Nürburgring. The reason why we have these huge end plates on the rear wing was also to actually help the rear end stay together when you mount it on the back of the car. This is the thing about these wild cars and their development. It's a continual cycle of adding more power and more grip and then strengthening the car so it doesn't break. Before starting the cycle, 
all over again. So onto the movable aero bits, and it's actually quite simple. The rear wing top element opened up just like DRS in F1 to shed drag at the rear. And that's great, but there is a problem with it. In F1, you have a DRS system on the rear wing, which moves the aero balance forward which means that you can only really use it in a straight line. So drag and grip removed from the rear means more grip to the front. And that's all well and good when there's no turning to do, but not so good when you're trying to go through a rouge, where the chances of losing the rear would be high. So the Porsche engineers needed to rebalance the car. And so they did that by adding a movable part to the front diffuser. At high speeds, the trailing edge of the front diffuser would lower to reduce drag and downforce. So this, along with the rear wing DRS, was known as the low downforce mode. Although in reality, it still produced more downforce than the original 919 race car in high downforce spec, which is just incredible. It meant that corners like Eau Rouge and Blanchemont were still flat out, even with the car in low downforce mode. And to get a sense of how quick it was, just watch this. And the added benefit of low downforce mode was that it gave the tyres a relative break when going down the long straights. Remember from earlier, the tyres are going through a huge amount of strain. And this system meant there's a little less load squashing the tyres down the straights. And so with the aerodynamics sorted, there's not too much left. Add a pinch of lightness, some genius suspension tricks and complicated driver aids and the team would be good to go. By the way, if you'd like to drive an F1 car on an F1 circuit, enter our competition for an all expenses paid trip to drive an F4 car and an F1 car at Paul Ricard with coaching from me. Entries close this Sunday at midnight, link in the description below. Next, the team managed to save about 50 kilograms in weight. They actually managed to remove a bit more than that, but some of the new body parts were larger and stronger, which meant that some of the lightness was actually removed, I think. The team removed the side mirrors as there was no competition to defend against, and the headlights and tail lights were also removed, as this was a daytime only car. There was also a marshalling system that the race car ran, which was telemetry and an ECU for the FIA to monitor what Porsche were up to, which was also removed. And finally, the driver cooling equipment was taken out as engineers generally care more about a tenth of a second than driver comfort. And I'm only half joking here. To be fair to the Porsche engineers, they did think about drivers with regard to the steering, but probably only because it was going to make the car faster. Again, I'm joking, kinda. The 919 race car had power steering, but with the Evo creating 50% more downforce, the steering system was going to be a problem. We realized that the steering torque and the steering assistance required was so high that the current system couldn't do it. And it's these details that you might not think about with such a cool project. The previous car was built for a defined amount of power and downforce, and increasing power and grip is just part of the project. You then need to have the rest of the car be able to survive with those loads. Anyway, the engineers at Porsche solved the problem by adding an extra power steering pump to add power to the system while remaining reliable. And there was trickery going on with the braking system too. The LMP1 race cars had brake-by-wire systems on the front axle. Brake-by-wire, or BBW, integrates traditional hydraulic braking with electronic control that also charges the battery system. But for the Evo, the team added brake-by-wire to all four corners of the car. And this helped them a lot with the record attempts, particularly at the Nürburgring. This braking system meant that each tire would have something like ABS. If the tire was about to lock up, if it was under-rotating compared to the car's speed, the system would lower the amount of braking to that tire. And this helps on normal circuits like Spa or Brands Hatch, but it particularly helps on more bumpy circuits like the Nordschleifer, where a traditional non-assisted setup would mean it would be easy to lock a tire. This system would take care of that, meaning shorter braking zones, but also more confidence for the driver, allowing them to push harder. The independent control of each wheel also meant that the car had a form of stability and traction control, all giving the driver more confidence at the Nürburgring, which 
Having driven there is exactly what you need. The Evo suspension was also really interesting. The original race car was already allowed to run front to rear interconnected suspension. This is where the front and rear suspensions are hydraulically linked, which allows the car to stay at a more consistent pitch in order to help aerodynamics. And with such a huge front diffuser that runs close to the ground, this is important. You don't want the gap to the ground changing too much as it will change the overall grip and balance of the car. And this special suspension also allowed the Evo to keep itself off the ground. With all that extra downforce, if it didn't have this type of suspension, the car would have buried itself into the track at high speed. And of course, this would cause issues with the aerodynamics, but also in just wearing the bottom of the car away. But the really interesting thing is that the Evo team added a device that allowed them to control the ride height of the front of the car. It wasn't fully active suspension like we saw in F1 in the 90s, but they could control it. We basically could just turn off this pumping effect or this leverage effect from the rear axle to the front when we wanted to. This meant they could control the front of the car for better weight distribution and aero. For example, when coming out of a corner, the weight of a car moves to the rear and away from the front. But with this system, it was possible to control when and how much the front of the car was rising up, allowing them to manipulate the pitch of the car throughout the corner. Very clever stuff. This project was extraordinary, and I'm so happy that Porsche said yes to putting the resources into it. I could tell from talking to Stephen, it's one of the best things he's ever worked on, and he's been involved in a lot. And I think that sums it up perfectly. I also asked the ex-head of aerodynamics at Ferrari how he'd design an F1 car if there were no rules. You can see that here. Thanks for watching, and please consider subscribing.